Good morning and welcome to Bethel this morning. Good morning. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know, um, as you know, Rick has been gone this week. His mom had a heart attack on Monday night, and so he's been down there with his family, and she passed away this morning. So we will probably be gone much of the week with the funeral and all. So we'd appreciate you continuing to pray. Let's start our service with prayer, and then we'll sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your, your goodness to us. We thank you that you're with us. And even when we go through the really difficult things of life, you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you. I pray that you'd be with us this morning, and we thank you for Garrett who came up to, to give us the message this morning. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's start by standing, and we're going to sing Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> Oh 
Seven o'clock on Tuesday morning is Bible study, men's Bible study, and Doug, is it at your house? It's going to be here at church. It'll be here at church. Okay, so men's Bible study, 7 a.m. Tuesday here at the church for the next month. Um, and then at 6.30 is senior high youth group. On Thursday, uh, we will have um, women's Bible study at 3 o'clock. If I'm not able to be here, Michelle Griggs will lead it, but um, we'll still meet at the parsonage. And then at 6 o'clock, the ladies' Bible study is meeting at Eileen's home. The night of prayer and praise that we had scheduled for tonight is canceled. Um, upcoming, we have the Christmas cookie walk on December 14th. We also have the community Thanksgiving service here um, on the 27th. And pie will be served afterwards. The operation, we've been working on operation. Operation Christmas Child, and those boxes will all be headed down to Sturgeon or Sturgeon or Green Bay? Sturgeon, Sturgeon this week to be delivered. So thank you for all of you that um, participated in that. And also there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for the prayer chain. So if you want to be part of the prayer chain, there is a list there. You can put your phone number or your email address, and then um, we will get that set up. Let's continue worshiping. Um, we have a couple more songs. The first one is Trust and Obey, and it's number 349 in your hymn book. Yeah. 
The kids are dismissed to Children's Church, and Mike is going to come lead us in prayer. Good morning, everyone.
Well, he can tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. morning. Like, um, Dan? Mike. Mike. Dan, I was so close. Um, My name is Garrett. I'm a youth pastor from Green Bay, Wisconsin. I've been there for about four and a half years. Uh, So I'm really glad that I can be here and I'm uh, able to uh, preach for you this morning morning. Uh, I am married to my beautiful wife, Hope. We've been married for two and a half years at the end of this month uh, of November. And uh, I'm really glad that I'm able to be here. And I just think it really is um, a good picture of the body of Christ, that, uh, that we're not just these separate churches across the state of Wisconsin or America, that we can come together and that the moments when we are in mourning or in pain or in help, that we can come together and we can help one another. And so I am really blessed to be here, and I'm able to uh, preach for y'all this morning. And so uh, I want to start off with a story. And so like I said, me and my wife have been dating. Uh, We're married for two and a half years, but while we were dating, uh, I was at a conference for our denomination, and I was on my way back from that conference. It was me and a couple of coworkers. We were driving from Stevens Point, Wisconsin uh, to Green Bay. It's about an hour and a half away. Uh, And my wife, she texted me quick, like, hey, how long is it going to be? When are you going to be back home? How long is it going to take? And I texted her. I said, oh, I am 15 minutes out. And I took my phone and I play, put it away. Uh, and just so, because I want to talk, I wanted to debrief with my coworkers. Uh, what I meant when I sent that text was, oh, I'm 15 minutes outside of Stevens Point. I said it in a way that no one ever, no one ever says it like that. I said it in the complete wrong way. Uh, but my wife, she, a normal person, heard it and read it as, oh, you are 15 minutes out of Green Bay, so I'm going to see you in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but then I had to then drive to Green Bay, had to drop, drop some of my friends off, uh, and then actually come home. And so it was probably an hour and a half, two hours before I looked at my phone. Uh, and when I finally did look at my phone, I saw um, some text messages with some uh, exclamation points and some capital letters, uh, some phone calls that were unanswered, Uh, and when I finally got on the phone with my wife, uh, there maybe were a couple tears as well. She had thought that I was um, really face down in a ditch somewhere, that the car had exploded, that we were nowhere to be seen, uh, and then that was it, and that she was going to have to find uh, a new boyfriend. Uh, But uh, from there, she now made me download an app so she can now track my every location, uh, which I'm fine with. I have nothing to hide. Uh, but uh, I think it's, and, and I asked her, so she's fine with me telling the story. But I think uh, it's, this story is a really good illustration of how quickly, uh, when we worry about something, that it can just spiral out of control, that we can start with something that uh, if we just maybe think about it a little bit more, or it really is something that's out of our control, that when we start to worry about it, it can just eat away at us, that it can just bloom out of control, that um, really worry is something that we all struggle with, that uh, maybe for some of us that it's just a nuisance, it's something that kind of itches us at the back of our mind, that we've always got to worry about finances that we've always got to worry kind of about what's happening uh, next, what is the next stage of our lives, what's the next step of our uh, marriages. Um, But for some of us in this room, uh, that worry is debilitating. That is something that every single day we feel like there's something that we're worried about. There's something that is uh, taking our eyes off of Jesus. That worry stops us from living in the way that Jesus wants us to live. And for some of these worries, that they're, they can be really big. I mean, I think of really what's been going on with uh, Rick's mom. Of like, that's something like if you're having a parent that is ill, that those are really big worries. And, having, and some of you probably have worries that are large and that they are cumbersome, but that doesn't give us license to then go and worry um, as much as we want. Instead, Jesus is calling us to have our eyes placed um, where they should be. And so uh, we're going to be in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34 this morning, uh, and which is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And I feel like Jesus right now, he gives us this section of teaching because he wants us to help navigate through what does it look like to fight off worry with the truth of who God is and his care for us. Before we keep going this morning, just let me pray for us this morning. Lord, we just thank you for who you are 
We thank you for your character, uh, that you love us, that you care for us, and most importantly, that you provide for us, and you've provided, most importantly, with your son, Jesus. And so we thank you for this morning. I pray, Lord, that we can, if we have any worry, that we can just leave it at the door, that we can instead, we can be focused on your word, that we can worship you now through just having a better understanding of who you are as we dive into the scriptures this morning. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. So we'll have the scripture up on the screen, uh, but if you want to flip there in your own Bible, we're in Matthew six twenty-five to 34, but just kind of give you a recap of kind of where we are right now in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus, he starts off this, and it's one of the largest teachings that Jesus has continuously in the New Testament, uh, and right now he's teaching to his followers, and he opens up the Sermon on the Mount with this teaching of, hey, I want you to be salt and light, that if you're going to be my follower, that you are are going to be, the, you're going to be these people that shine. You're going to be these people that, uh, we're going to live a certain way, and people are going to see how you live, and they are going to want to follow Christ. And then he goes and he gives uh, this litany of things of what to do, of this is how it looks like to pray, and this is what it looks like to give, and this is what it looks like to fast, and how should we uh, be thinking about anger, and adultery, and loving our enemies, and judging, and oaths, and the words that we take. And then finally, Jesus gets to this section in verse uh, 25 of chapter 6, and I think he has it placed here for a reason, because he wants us to understand that there's there's all these things that we have to do, that we need to, um, if we're going to shine, we need to live our life in a certain way, how Jesus wants us, but when we worry... It really takes our eyes away from how to live. We'll figure out that more as we dive into the scriptures, but you can read along with me. I'll start in verse 25, and I'll read all the way through 34. It goes, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, be, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even in Solomon, all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will um, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so Jesus starts off and he tells us, do not worry about these things. Do not worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or your clothes. That You have to remember that this is uh, in a culture where these things are not easy. That uh, It's not so much Washington Island where you have to plan your life about going off the island to go shopping, but it's uh, still... Uh, close enough to that where uh, they have to think about, okay, like, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What's going to happen if my clothes wear out, if my sandals wear out, if I don't have anything to wear or to have on my feet or to eat or drink, that these are real things that they have to be thinking about consistently and constantly. But Jesus wants them to know that, like, your life is not about these things. It's not about the day-to-day, what's in your stomach and what's on your back, but your life is more than this, that you cannot be so fixated on just the day-to-day things. You, you need to know that your life is more than that. And then Jesus goes and he points to these kind of two pictures, that the birds in the sky and the flowers of the field. He, um, they're outside right now. Jesus is probably in a field. He's speaking to all these people. And he probably says, look up. What, what do you see? You see the birds. You see the sparrows. They're in the sky. These, these sparrows, they're not like us. They don't go out uh, to their little bird barn and take out their bird farming equipment and they go plow the fields and they sow the seeds and they wait till harvest times. They bring out their bird tractor and they farm the fields and they stow it away in their bird barn. Like, no, that's not how to, at all how they work. That they're not like us. That they live each and every day. That each and every day the sparrow they go, goes out 
and it finds its food, that each and every day the Lord provides for them. That's how it works. And then Jesus asks a question with that illustration. He says, are you not much more valuable than the bird? Think of who you are, that you are made in God's image, that you are more valuable. How much more then will the Lord provide for you? That Jesus wants them to think about their importance compared to other parts of God's creation. But then as soon as Jesus asks that, he gives us another uh, just short, punchy rhetorical question. In verse 27, he asks, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That worrying does not accomplish anything. And and that's a question that we should be sitting on right now, that when things come in our life and that when we want to worry about them, I want you, next time that happens, to then sit and then worry for the next hour. And then once you're done, I want you to then think to yourself, like, what happened? Did that do anything? It's not Jesus is saying that on some spiritual basis that, yes, you should not be worrying, but also it is illogical to worry, that worrying does nothing, that it doesn't fix the problem, it doesn't move you forward, that worrying does not do anything. And so it's something that even though we might want to do it, that we might want to complain about it, that we might want to be fixated on these things, but instead we know that worrying does not add anything to our lives. Then Jesus, next he goes and he points to the flowers of the field. He says that, look at them. Look at how they are. They don't do anything as well. They don't spin or they don't toil. They're not worried about how they're going to present themselves. But they are beautiful. He says that not even Solomon in all of his splendor can compare to the beauty of these flowers. And Solomon is this Old Testament king, and he's always described as having um, horses and camels and gold. He's like uh, the modern day, pick pick your billionaire. He is the uh, Jeff Bezos. He's the Elon Musk. That he is all this wealth. He can buy any clothes he wants. He can have the most designer. He can have the most beautiful looking gold plated uh, studded clothes. But the simple flower of the field does not compare to the riches of this Old Testament king. That the just simple wildflower is so much more beautiful than him. And it's because God made it that way, because God provided for it. And these things about these flowers, it's not even that they're here and they're eternal and they last for a long time. It's that they're here one day and they're gone tomorrow. That they're kindling, that they're used for fire, that even though that there's this wonderful, beautiful flower that um, is more beautiful than anything else, that it is just, it is just, uh, it's just fuel. That's all that it is. But God still provides for it. And then Jesus asks the same question. Are you not much more than this flower, you of little faith? That when we start to think about ourselves in comparison to the rest of God's creation, that we rise above it, that we are so intentionally and wonderfully made, that if we acknowledge that God provides for these things— how much more then is he going to provide for us? In verse 31 then he commands us, do not be like the pagans. Don't be worried about what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what clothes are we going to have. That Jesus says, do not be like them because for them they follow false gods that don't care about them, that don't uh, know the things that they actually need. That for them that they just try to figure out how are these things going to happen but they do not have a God that cares for them, that they don't have a God that loves them. Jesus says that, in verse 32, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus is saying that these um, people, that they, 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 don't, they don't know who God is, they don't follow Yahweh, that they go and they have to chase after these things because they don't have a God that will provide for them, but you have a God that loves you. That you have a God that provides for you. That he knows the things that you need. And he knows that you are uh, more than the the flowers of the field. More than the birds of the sky. And so he is going to provide for you. And so because of that, we need to trust 
in him. Jesus then addresses where our focus should be, that if we have, um, if we have a God that cares for us, that loves for us, that knows what we need, that we don't have to be worried about how we're going to be provided for. We don't have to be the one that's thinking about how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to put clothes on my back? How am I going to care for my family? Instead, Jesus says that your focus should be on the kingdom. That your focus should be pursuing Jesus, um, pursuing him and his righteousness. And that when we focus on all those things, that they will be given to you. But it's not so much of a, hey, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, that if you follow me, that I'm going to provide for you. Jesus is saying that when you have your eyes fixed on the kingdom, that when you have your eyes fixed on Jesus and following him, and when your eyes are fixed on being the city on the hill that I talked about, when you're um, fixated on shining and living for Jesus, then God's going to provide for you. That we don't need to worry, that he knows the things that we need. And when we have our eyes focused in the right direction, everything else falls in place. That sure, you might want more, and you might think you need more, but the reality is that the things that you need, the things that, um, that, you will, that you can have and you'll be content with, you will have those things because our Lord provides for us. This leads me into this main idea that I think Jesus is trying to teach is that don't worry because God knows what you need and he provides that. Don't, do not worry because God knows what you need and he provides. Because so I think uh, sometimes we really undervalue how much God loves us and he cares for us. I think sometimes we can look at our lives and we can uh, be experiencing tragedy, that we can be experiencing hardship, that we can uh, just not have the things that we want, that we can look at the people around us and we can think like, God, why does everyone have so much and I don't have anything? Or why do I have so little? And we can begin to think about like, God, why, do you actually care about me? That we can look around us and we can be so fixated on everything else that we then start to provide for ourselves. We try to think, how can I um, get what I want? But instead, if we really think about how much our Lord cares for us, that we would see that he loves us supremely. That Jesus points to God's love through the provision that he gives um, through creation. It says, God provides for creation. He paints this picture of them and then us, that he provides for them. So how much more is he going to provide for, uh, for us? How much more does God care for you? So me and my wife, we have a dog, Maple. We love her very much. We've had her for about a year, uh, and I love this dog. It's very much, it's like, um, I wouldn't say it's our child, but it's, uh, but it's this animal we love. It's our first dog that we've had as a married couple, and so we do the right things to, make, to show this dog that we love it, that we, uh, we get it good food, that we uh, walk the dog regularly, that I throw the ball for her, that I do all these things because I love this dog. But I love my wife more. <laughs> Like, I love my wife so much more, meaning that I'm going to do so much more than I ever would for this dog, that at the end of this day, this dog's a dog, but my wife uh, is the one that I'm married to. And because I love her so much more, means that I'm going to provide for her so much more, that I'm going to, um, if she ever needs anything, the dog gets booted out, like, the dog's not important. The dog does not uh, have importance compared to who my wife is, so I'm going to take her on vacation. I'm going to make sure that she knows that she is the object of my affection, that I'm going to do everything everything I can to show her how much I love her. And the same is true for God, that yes, um, his creation is good and is important and that he loves it, but compared to that, that we are so much more. That like I said that uh, in Genesis when it talks about us, that we are made in the image of God, that we are the imago Dei, that we have such incredible importance to God. And so because of that, that he is going to provide for us. The Psalms tell us that he knows us intimately. That he was there when we were formed in our, our mother's wombs. That he knows the hairs on our head. That he knows when we rise and when we sit. That he loves us and he knows us intimately. And then he, for each one of us, that he does provide for us. And you might think, you know what, Garrett? Like, you're, I don't know who you are. Uh, and I... I think I've kind of gotten the, the bad end of the stick. 
And I, and like, sure, there's been sm- um, small things, but like the Lord has left me high and dry more than I can count. And I'm actually not sure if that statement is true. Like, does he actually provide for me? And I would tell you that Jesus has provided for each and every one of us in the most important way by giving us his son, Jesus. That that is the thing that we needed most. And the thing that we still need most today, that we um, are just sinful people that are um, broken by sin, and if it was not for Jesus, that we'd be stuck. That there's nothing that we can do, we cannot save ourselves from our sin, that the wages of sin is death, and that we are all uh, corrupted by it. There's no way that we're able to save ourselves, but it is only through Jesus that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through Him. That Jesus made a way for us to be, uh, to be a un- reunited with the Father. That is, through him, that his righteousness has been imputed onto us, so that we can finally have a right relationship with God. And so, Jesus has provided for us. That God has provided for us. That is, through Jesus, that we receive ultimate provision. That if everything else falls away, that that is it. That that is the one thing we need, and it's for us to know our Father. And so sure, we might not have uh, gotten the life that we exactly wanted. We haven't gotten the things that maybe are that we really desire, but the most important thing is that Jesus has made a way that each and every one of us can know our Heavenly Father, and it is through Him. So when worry comes, we need to remember who our God is. We need to remember his character. And it is through his great love that he cares for us and that he provides for us. But it doesn't mean that then all pain is going to be taken away. That just because he provides for us and because he cares for us, it doesn't mean that he is going to then take away every hard circumstance that is maybe happening to us right now or will happen to us in the future. That God is still going to work through those things, that he is still going to be there, and he's going to be providing, but it doesn't look like taking away of any hard circumstance. Instead, in those moments, when we trust and God provides, sometimes he gives us what we need to get through that circumstance. It's not about taking away, but it's providing through the circumstance. I've uh, been in a lot of counseling situations uh, just recently, and I, a phrase that I've been uh, clinging to recently, just wanting to be impart to impart to other people, is that the only way out is through. That Jesus doesn't always take away everything, but sometimes He just gives us enough, and He provides for us enough, so that we re- we rely on Him to get through what we are going through. And a psalm that's been, something that's been stuck in my mind as I think about this is Psalm 23, verses 1 through 4. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Think about that. That the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. That the Lord has provided everything that I have, everything that I need, He has provided. I lack nothing because I have the good shepherd as my shepherd, that he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That even when we are going through these valleys and we're going through these dark places, that we have a good shepherd that he provides for us. That when we're going through these, we might think that we don't have enough when the reality is that we lack nothing. That we have such a good shepherd that cares for us and that he provides himself. And sometimes the only provision that we actually need is just him. That we don't need anything else in this world. That the reality is that sometimes we just need our father. We need to cling close to him. And so Jesus calls us not to worry. That he calls us to instead have our focus be on him. That he knows that when we worry that our eyes, they shift off of Jesus and it shifts to all the things that we don't have and all the things that we could have. And we start to worry 
more and more and that when we do that, it's, it stops us from being light. It stops us from being salt in the world. And so Jesus says, hey, I want you to know who your father is. I want you to know that your heavenly father, that he loves you, that he will provide for you, that he cares for you. And once you understand that, once you know those things are true, you can have your eyes fixed on me. That you can have your eyes fixed on growing for the kingdom. You can have your eyes fixed on reaching people. That you can have your eyes fixed on what does it look like to fast in the right way, to pray in the right way, to live in the right way so that way other people can know Jesus. That you can be focused on continually spreading the gospel all around you, whether it's to your neighbors that know, don't know Jesus, to your family members that don't know him. But when you truly know who God is, and that he's care for us will take away any worry in our mind. When we remember the truth of God's provision in our lives, that there will be no need to worry. That we can stay fixed on who Jesus is. Let me pray for us this morning. Lord, I just pray for anyone that is worrying this morning. Lord, I pray just for those that are in hard circumstances. I pray for the person here, Lord, that that they just don't trust your character, that they have gotten uh, just the wrong end of the stick, Lord, and they are hurting. Lord, I pray that you would just soften their heart to the truth of who you are, that they would remember and know just how good you are, how much you love them, how much you care for them, how much uh, they would just remember that you are sovereign, that you are this big God, that you are in control, that you are in control of everything. And so there's no need to worry, that they would trust in your power, in your goodness, that you provide everything that they need. We praise all your name. Amen.